Hi, Kristen Atchison here, and we are talking about development through the lifespan. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about different theories of cognitive development. So the first one we're going to talk about is Piaget. Um, that's this lovely gentleman here. Um, and it's one of the theories we spend most time on this class, um, just based on the impact it had on the way we thought about um, cognitive development. The image above is um, an image of a conservation task. So Piaget is a stage theory, um, and so that's why it kind of looks like this stair step here, um, is because it's it's that's how Piaget thought of cognitive development, that you had to go through these stages in a certain order, um, that you had to master one before you could move on to the next, um, and that, um, that they each built upon each other. Um, so the first stage is sensory motor from zero to two. Um, this is really that kind of how Piaget thought that the infant was exploring the world um, strictly through sensory information. Um, that during this stage is when we'll start to develop object permanence, um, realizing an object is still there even though it's not in view. Um, because of that, um, we'll start to have kind of se separation anxiety from parents, things like that. Um, that the infant is really acting on its environment and that is what's causing um, development. So um, Piaget really thought of um, children as kind of, kind of experimenters um, with the incoming information from the sensory environment and kind of experimenting um, on their environment. The next stage is the pre-operational stage. And this is when we're going to see this language, which is where we're starting to see that symbolic thought, um, that a word, the word ball represents ball. Um, this is when we'll start seeing all that pretend. Um, but the child is really very egocentric and really only, according to Piaget, see things through their own perspective. Now, if you think back to what we've already talked about, about theory of mind, that's not necessarily the case. So we already are starting to see some things that you we've already learned about that don't necessarily mesh with Piaget's theory. Um, concrete operational, this is where we're starting to have some logical thought, um, adding and subtracting, um, understands conservation tasks, which we'll talk about. And then formal operations is really this abstract thought and hypothetical terms. This is really that higher order thinking. Um, and Piaget said we wouldn't see that till about 12. So, um, so again, that first stage, that sensory motor, that infants are experiencing the world through movement and senses. Um, they're going to develop these schemas, this kind of um, idea of how things are supposed to work, of how something's supposed to be. Um, and they start to act intentionally. Um, they, again, will have this evidence of object permanence, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, Pre-operations, we have um, those motor skills but and some of that verbal stage, but we're not going to have the idea that of the conservation of physical properties, and we'll talk about that again a little bit more. Um, we also will have, um, we'll, by the end of this, um, we'll start, Piaget will say, to have theory of mind again, this is not jiving with already with some of the things that we know. Concrete operations, children can think logically about the physical world around them, and we can have that hypothetical uh, by the time we get to, to formal operations. Okay, so the major accomplishments of the sensory motor stage is object permanence. Object permanence is the knowledge that objects have properties and exist independent of the infant's actions. Um, so just because we don't see the ball doesn't mean the ball ceases to exist. Just because I don't have the ball and I don't see the ball doesn't mean the ball doesn't exist if, I, if someone hides it under the table. We all know that, right? Um, but um, Piaget said um, that it wasn't towards till the end of this period, um, so 18 months, two years, that we're really seeing this come out. Other accomplishments in the sensory motor stage, self-concept, they can just tell themselves from others. Um, they can learn that others exist and act independently of themselves. And again, that representational or symbolic thought, which is going to really be the underlying um, for language development. Um, thinking back to language development, think about what we already know, um, that comprehension produces precedes production. Um, so just because children weren't saying words doesn't mean that they didn't understand them and that they didn't have representational or symbolic thought earlier. So let's watch a real quick little video on object permanence. Jean Piaget proposed a comprehensive theory of child cognitive development 
identifying four major periods or stages of cognitive development. The first of these stages, the sensory motor stage, spans the age range from birth to two years. During the sensory motor stage, infants learn to coordinate sensory information and motor activity, becoming increasingly able to act purposefully on their environments and solve problems. At the beginning of the sensory motor period, an infant's actions are confined to innate reflexes like sucking and grasping. Soon, however, infants will begin to show what Piaget called primary circular reactions. One week old Aiden moves his hand near his mouth by chance. In the next few weeks, he will begin to try to reproduce this pleasurable experience, eventually sucking his thumb or hand purposefully. Jessapina, who is two months old, has learned that it is interesting to open and close her own hands near her face. While primary circular reactions center on a child's own body, secondary circular reactions involve making interesting things happen in the world outside one's body. By chance, six-week-old Iselin causes the toy on the side of her bouncy seat to move but quickly figures out how to keep it going. And five-month-old James, again by chance, pushes a button on his toy and causes music to play. After several attempts, he is able to make the music start again at his own discretion. <laughs> Unlike primary circular reactions, secondary circular reactions are not based on reflexes, but represent the first acquired adaptations of new behaviors. At about eight months of age, children show the first signs of planned, intentional behavior. Nine-month-old Hayden, for example, drops one toy to grasp another. Can you get big kisses? Can you give it? Oh, you want to eat the box. You want to eat the box. No, nope, back to the number. He also figures out how to move an obstacle, the exorcer, to pick up a desired toy. Before this, secondary reactions were executed for their own sake. Now Hayden has learned that one secondary circular reaction can be used in the service of another. Hayden now uses two previously acquired schemes in coordination to achieve a goal, dropping one toy to grasp another, and moving an obstacle to retrieve a toy. Tertiary circular reactions occur between 12 and 18 months of age. At this stage, infants begin to actively experiment with the world, to do things just to see what will happen. Tess, for example, tries a number of locations for the teething ring, ending up wearing it as a bracelet. The development of object permanence is one of the more notable cognitive changes occurring during the sensory motor period. Children younger than about four months of age are unaware that objects continue to exist when they are no longer visible. Two-month-old Jessapina does not even look for the toy when it is hidden. Between four and eight months, however, infants begin to retrieve objects that are partially hidden behind a barrier, as six-month-old Anthony demonstrates. By 8 to 12 months, infants begin to show clearer signs of object concepts, consistently looking for objects when they are hidden. Under her hat. Tess, a 20-month-old, reaches right around a barrier to get to a toy. 
showing that she has achieved object permanence. Being able to represent objects mentally is an important cognitive change as it allows children to think about things they can't see or touch using insight and mental experimentation for solving problems instead of trial and error. walked you through the various stages and sub-stages of the sensory motor period. Um, you're not required to know what's the different sub-stages of the sensory motor period for this class, um, but it was still helpful to see kind of those changes in cognitive development that are happening. Um, the video also did a good job of talking about object permanence. So the next kind of tasks that we're going to talk about um, are conservation tasks. Remember we say conservation tasks um, are children are able to do these by the end by the concrete operational pay, um, pay, um, concrete operational stage um, but cannot do it in um, the pre-operational stage. Um, so the way this works is um, conservation tasks you can do them with play-doh which is the way that I usually do it. Um, you can do it with cups of water that's the video that you um, or cups of liquid that's the video that you have for your online participation. There's different ways to do it but the basic idea is um, that you take two things that are equal you change their shapes um, and you ask children questions about it. So here are the two equal um, Play-Dohs, you smush one down, you change their shape, and you ask questions. So in this first one, you'd say, okay, hey, um, are they, are these the different, are these have the different amount, the same amount, um, and if they're different, which one's bigger? And pretty much all the kids will say, oh, they're the same, because they're, they're brand new things of Play-Doh, they look the same, everything's the same. Then you change the shape of one of them, so you smash it down. And then you ask the children the same question. And what you'll see is you'll see different answers depending on the age of the child, depending on their ability to kind of reverse that task. So to take this smush Play-Doh and go back to saying, oh, but it was the same size, so it still must be the same size. Um, and so for, for younger children, that's going to be harder. So here are some videos um, of my daughter doing conservation tasks, um, the first of which is in um, one of our classrooms when she was able to come and be a quote unquote guest lecturer. Um, so here she is at six years old um, at the beginning of first grade. It's fatter? Okay. Are they the same or does that one have more? This one has more. Okay. Okay. Good job, baby. That's all. So she smashed it down. She said the flat one now has more. Um, so even though she had initially said, and I didn't get this recorded, um, that they were the same size, once she smashed one down, she said that the green one was bigger now um, because it was flatter. Um, so she was not able to pass that conservation task. She thought that the size had changed, um, which was incorrect, but was appropriate for where she was. She was just kind of at that end of that pre-operational stage. So here she is again um, in concrete operations. Um, she's eight years old in this next video. And so she should be able to pass this task, and she does. So let's look. And this time I videoed the whole thing. Hi, how old are you? Eight. Um, can you tell me about those Play-Dohs? Which one's bigger? Or are they the same? Um, it depends on how far you stretch them, but they're the same right now. They're the same right now. Yeah. So, one, the green Play-Doh, there's not more green Play-Doh, or there's not more no. orange Play-Doh? No. Okay, they're the same amount. Okay, take one of them and smash them down flat on the table. Okay. Now, 
before you said that they were the exact same amount of Play-Doh. Are they still the exact same amount of Play-Doh or did that change? They're still the exact same amount of Play-Doh. Why didn't it change? That one looks bigger now than the other one. Why didn't it change? Because you're just making it down. So if I push this one down to this side, it would be the same thing. Right, so, so it's, still the same thing. it's still the same amount. It didn't change. Mm -mm. Thank you. So she was able to remember what the other one was, remember that they were the same size, and she was able to think kind of logically and say, hey, if I mash down the orange, it's gonna look the same. Um, it doesn't change how much Play-Doh is, it just changes the shape of the Play-Doh. Um, and so that's what you'll see again um, in that transition in a conservation task between pre-operational and concrete operational stage. So, as you've already guessed, there are definitely challenges to Piagetian theory. Um, one of them is that cognition is rooted in action. Um, so, infants show knowledge before they have the motor skills. So, Piaget, again, thought that infants were little experimenters, that they had to experiment um, through their actions on the world. Um, but we see that infants have a lot of abilities before they have these motor skills. Um, so Piaget was only looking at things through these motor questions, and so he was only able to see things kind of through this motor lens. Um, and so we really see that that's not necessarily the case. Another um, challenge to Piagetian theory um, is the concept of stages. Um, that infants m must always be in the same stage for um, at, at one time you can only be in pre-operational or you can only be in concrete operational. And that's not necessarily the case. We'll see kids will be doing one thing at one level and another thing at another level um, and then another kid will have that reversed. Um, and so this idea that you're always in the same stage um, for different domains isn't really... Um, isn't really accurate, isn't really a, a helpful theoretical view. Um, so again, remember when we talked about dynamic systems theory, this idea um, of this web of development, um, this idea that, um, that we have this kind of, um, we all end up at the same place, but there's different ways to get there instead of this stair step. Um, and that we can have a change on one level, so we like learn how to do a motor skill, and that will cause the infant to reorganize on other levels as well. Um, so again, this will be a challenge. <clears throat> one thing that we see is that children are, um, younger children are much more advanced than Piaget thought. Um, so the theory of mind is a great example of that. We've already gone through that theory of mind research, and we see that kids are way better at these things, about thinking about things from others' perspective um, than, the, than Piaget thought they were. So that's going to be a, cr a criticism. We'll see the same thing when it comes to object permanence. We're going to see that kids have object permanence way, way earlier than Piaget thought. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second. A lot of his tasks were really unfamiliar um, and either required verbal or motor competence. Um, and so it was hard for kids to pass these tasks um, when they couldn't really, they were unfamiliar and they didn't necessarily have the skills to pass the task. That didn't mean that they un didn't understand the thought process behind it, that they didn't have those cognitive skills, but they maybe didn't have those motor skills or maybe they didn't have those verbal skills. Um, and so again, we'll see that, um, that it wasn't that they didn't have object permanence or they didn't have theory of mind. It was that the tasks were too difficult and unfamiliar for the kids to be able to show that they had object permanence or show that they had theory of mind. Um, so again, we've got pers uh, we've got uh, people's ability to protect perspective take much earlier um, in childhood um, than Piaget thought. And on the other side of that, so we said he thought you know, kids weren't near as advanced as they were, young, young infants and children. Um, on the other side of that coin is he thought adolescents and teenagers were way more advanced than they were. Um, so in adolescence, we actually see a much lower level of performance than Piaget thought. Um, he thought that they were able to really engage and really hypodeductive reasoning and this like being able to think everything through hypothetically and we see that we're really not as great at that even as adults as Piaget thought um, that we can kind of prompt or train someone to do this um, but that some cultures don't even actually get to Piaget's level of operational thought of um former operations, and that's because the role of education, um, that we really teach hypothetical thinking. Um, we That's something that has to kind of be learned and taught. 
Um, whereas different cultures who have different kind of educational systems may not have that. Um, so again, it can't be a good theory of universal cognitive development if it's cultural specific. Um, and Piaget's theory really had that, especially in this piece of formal operations. Okay, so let's talk about some of these competing theories. Um, one of the first ones we're going to talk about is the nativist approach. And the first way, kind of the big, the first big red flag we saw for Piaget's um, object permanence, um, the um, object permanence in his theory um, was the violation of expectation task. So with the way that task works um, is infants are shown something unexpected. So like in this picture here, we'll see, we see a box on one side, a ball on one side, the box goes behind the ball, I mean behind the screen, the ball comes out the other side. That's unexpected, right? Um, a box can't turn into a ball. Um, so if an infant knows the difference between those shapes and those colors, they should be surprised because their expectation has been violated. So we record the amount of time infants spend looking at these events that are either consistent or inconsistent with their way of understanding objects. Same thing with object permanence. I'm um, kind of whether something should, is that thing still there even though it's not there. Um, you have a video um, from on the violation of expectation task to watch. Um, it was developed by Renee Ballerajon um, and it's her kind of talking through this, her this development of this task in this kind of first way that we saw that object permanence is happening much, much, much earlier than we thought. Um, so typically when an infant finds an event inconsistent or unexpected, they're going to look a lot longer at it. Remember, Piaget was asking verbal tasks. He was asking motor tasks. And that's a lot more complicated, where infants have pretty good control over their looks when they're born, and they have even better control over it by the time that they're six months. Then we're, we're up to adult-like um, vision. So they have control over those eyes earlier, but we'll see adult-like acuity by about six months. So again, this is, this is kind of an area that infants can then answer questions through these kind of looking time studies much, much earlier than we would have seen in other studies. So this is kind of like that preferential looking study, only instead of having to choose between two things to look at, um, we're just going to record the amount of time infants spend looking at something and compare those. So this is where this nativist approach started, that we were seeing object permanence much, much earlier, um, like about a year earlier um, than Piaget thought. And this really um, kind of sparked a new kind of um, perspective on cognitive development, um, this nativist approach, this idea of core knowledge, that infants are kind of um, born with some basic knowledge um, prior to learning it from the environment. And that these, this knowledge is kind of specific to different domains. Um, so that infants know some things about other people. So infants know some things um, about objects. So infants know some things about these different kinds of um, things. And this idea of core knowledge was first proposed by Elizabeth Spelke um, and some of her colleagues. Um, and we have a video that you should be watching too um, on, from Karen Wynn, um, and it is a violation of expectation task, um, but it's looking at addition and subtraction. Um, and core knowledge would say that, hey, look, um, this task shows that infants have a kind of an innate sense of number um, before they learn to add and subtract. PJ is saying that, hey, you're not learning to add and subtract until you're in concrete operations, until you can kind of go back and forth. Um, but hey, but really earlier, Wynn and Spelke are saying, hey, look at these babies, these six months olds doing this. Um, that, they say, indicates some of this domain-specific knowledge to that. So that's kind of another, um, and, and really the nativist approach has gone back um, and um, both the nativists and the information processing have gone back and looked at a lot of the Piagetian's work, the Piagetian work, and kind of updated the task to ways that infants could actually answer them um, or children could actually answer them earlier, make the task more friendly so they could ask the question a little bit more accurately. Um, and so we see that um, while well, Piaget was kind of a great framework for us to start studying, and that it's that theory, that theoretical framework is not really the one in which we still study infant development and child development and cognition. Um, now we're looking at it from these information processing, we're looking at it from these nativist approach of core knowledge, um, things like that. Another big um, theoretical 
um, framework is Vygotsky and his social co uh, cultural approach. Um, so whereas Piaget was all, hey, infants are little scientists and they're experimenting on their world, Piaget is saying, hey, no, um, infants and children are uh, an apprentice and they're kind of just learning from this social interaction. They're seeing someone else do it and then they're learning to do it. It's not necessarily through their own action, as Piaget would say, but it's through that social interaction um, that the social interaction is where these, this cognitive development is coming from. One of the big things that Piaget taught, I'm not Piaget, I'm sorry, Vygotsky talked about um, was the zone of proximal development. And this is this range of tasks that children can't do on their own but need a more skilled helper. At the bottom of the zone of proximal development, they're going to be able to kind of do those things kind of on their own. At the top end of that, um, that range, they're going to need support. Um, and so what we'll see is there's a range of things where they, they can do it. Um, at the bottom end of that, they're not going to need the support. At the top end of that, they are going to need the support. Um, and how we provide that support is through scaffolding. Um, so think about scaffolding like on a building when you're trying to reach a higher level to clean a win window or build something. It's the same idea, um, that you're able to reach a higher level of, of action, of thought, um, because of this, this support that you're being provided, Vygotsky would say, from social interaction. So someone is helping you, someone is teaching you. So this is a picture of my daughter when she was like 18 months old, um, and her cousin who's nine months older than her. So she got these crayons um, for Christmas, and we were visiting um, her, uh, our, our relatives, um, and they were finger crayons. And so you could stick them on the end of your finger, and you could kind of just draw with your finger then. But they also stacked. So she got these crayons, and she was really good at putting them on her fingers, and was, had been playing with them like that. She takes them to Texas. She sees her cousin, who's nine months older than her, and he starts stacking them. And she's like, oh, cool, you can stack them. And so she learns that you can stack these things through this interaction with this older, more experienced peer. That older, more experienced peer that's providing the scaffolding doesn't have to be an adult. So he's only nine months older than her, but he's older and he's more experienced, especially in this time period. And so what we see is that he ends up providing that scaffolding for her um, for just how to, how to play with these crayons. Um, and I know that seems like a silly example, like, hey, playing with crayons, but it's about object properties. It's about different ways that objects work together. Um, and so again, he was able to support her to do something that she wasn't doing on her own um, through this, this scaffolding. So again, Vygotsky really emphasized the social and cultural processes um, that, that really facilitated cognitive development. Again, just like Piaget, um, he's really this theoretical framework. Um, and the problem with, um, one of the reasons we don't have as much research on Vygotsky is because we, what, one of the things that happened was Vygotsky was doing research um, in a very different time period, in a very different location, and his research didn't really kind of get out to the, the larger psychological community until after he passed away. And so then we kind of went back and um, evaluated it. We'll see Vygotsky's going to be really, really big um, in educational um, psychology and kind of this educational view because what is education but scaffolding, right, is like supporting you to get to a higher level, um, teaching you through this social interaction um, is how you learn. And so we'll see that Vygotsky's themes um, are really um, echoed a lot in educational research. Um, so he again looked at things from this historical cultural perspective, um, that the ideas that mental development, cognitive development is coming out of these social interactions, um, and that thought and action are really mediated by the cultural tools, um, not um, just the individual's interactions. So again, Piaget really thought um, that kids were little experimenters, little scientists, you know, experimenting on the world and finding out um, the information from themselves. And Vygotsky says, no, it's really this social interaction. They're more like an apprentice. They're learning from this more expert peer um, or more expert peers. Um, and that's what's facilitating cognitive development. So those are those kind of major theories of um, cognitive development that we're going to talk about. Now we're going to kind of go switch into adulthood. And there has been various research that says that there may be a cognitive decline in research. Um, remember when we first talked about um, development, we talked about different kinds of research designs. 
um, cross-sectional designs and longitudinal designs. Um, so for a long time, we really thought that there was this, cro this, um, this cognitive decline or this really big cognitive decline because we were doing cross-sectional research. So we were taking a group of 25-year-olds, a group of 32-year-olds, 39, 46, 43, 53, all the way up to 88, and we were measuring them at one point in time in a cross-sectional research study. And what we found there is that there was a big difference, um, and in this case, we're talking about verbal ability scores. We were seeing that 25-year-olds um, and, you know, 53-year-olds were all kind of performing about the same, but after the 60s, we really start to kind of go down dramatically, and by the time we get to 88, um, we're, we've got a much different score than we did earlier on. The problem with that, um, and again, these were verbal ability scores. Um, the problem with that is cohort effects. So remember, um, if I'm studying a group of 25-year-olds now and a group of 88-year-olds now, um, the 25-year-olds and the 88-year-olds have lived very, very different lives. 25-year-olds have had um, computers in their life the entire time. Um, they've had the internet in their life the entire, almost the entire time, if not the entire time. Um, so we're seeing a very different um, life um, than we're seeing an 88-year-old um, who um, who didn't have those access, didn't have different, very different educational systems, had very different set of expectations on what was expected of them. Um, and so what we're really seeing is the difference of cohort effects. Because when we go back and we do that research longitudinally, and that's going to be the yellow line, um, what we'll actually see is when we follow 25-year-olds until they're 88, um, we do not see that same decline. What we see is actually an increase in verbal ability, um, and then a kind of gradual level, leveling off, but to about the same level that we were in our uh, in our twenties. So we're not seeing those great um, declines. Again, these cohort effects can be things due to health, education, um, things like that, um, and it also may be that the tasks aren't. Um, tapping that same kind of information that are used by older individuals. Um, when we're trying to write, a, you know, a verbal test, um, you know, the vocabulary that different generations use is different. And so if we're not tailoring that test to those generations and the language that they're using, we might see differences as well. Um, another one that we're going to talk about is a longitudinal study out of Seattle. They took 5,000 participants between the ages of 22 and 70, um, and they have data spanning 60 years, okay? So they follow them from 22 to 70, so we have this really long range of data. And they looked at five different factors, um, verbal ability, um, inductive reasoning, actually I looked at six, sorry, um, inductive reasoning, verbal memory, spatial orientation, um, and numeric ability. And those five actually gained um, in cognition over through middle adulthood. So we see increases from 25 um, to um, kind of 60s in the 50s. We see those big increases, which is again what we saw on that slide before, right? When we looked at longitudinal data, we saw this increase um, instead of a decrease. The only one that we really do see that has a big, big decrease over the time from 25 to 88 um, is really perceptual speed. And so we'll see kind of how fast or processing um, goes down. Um, but usually that's compensated for other kinds of skills that we'll talk about in a second. And we do see that this kind of intellectual prime, um, kind of our best, as, as good as we're going to get intellectually, um, is in this middle adulthood, this middle age, um, because we have the best of kind of both sets of skills, um, both what we'll talk about is crystallized and fluid intelligence. So fluid intelligence um, are those basic information processing skills, um, detecting relationships, our speed of processing, our working memory. Um, and this is where we see is declining. So when we saw that perceptual speed was the decline, this is that fluid intelligence. And it drops steadily throughout adulthood. But the reason that we don't always see differences in terms of performance between younger adults and older adults in kind of everyday tasks is because of things like crystallized intelligence. And these are skills that depend on accumulated knowledge. And so when you're 88, you've had more time to accumulate knowledge than when you're 25. And so things like that can start to kind of compensate. Same thing with experiences and judgments, um, mastery of social conventions. Um, these things 
when you have lived longer, you have a more of an ex opportunity to have those things and those can increase. And those can kind of pick up um, for some of those declines that we see in fluid intelligence. We can also see that this can be, this crystallized intelligence can really be valued by a person's culture. Sometimes we can kind of start to re, uh, view to some extent wisdom. Some people have that, that kind of view of that. Um, we see that this really rises through middle adulthood. Um, so this is where we're seeing, well, we'll see that fluid de intelligence decline. We'll see this rise in these other five levels these, that um, indicate really crystallized intelligence. And so we really won't see this kind of, um, any kind of changes in function. This again peaks between 45 and 54, that middle adulthood, and we really don't see any declines in crystallized intelligence until into the 80s. Um, so we're really seeing that this kind of, um, um, that kind of compensation almost, that while fluid intelligence is decreasing, crystallized intelligence is increasing, and so we actually see again this kind of intellectual prime in middle adulthood. This ends our conversation on cognitive development. Thanks.